Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us for today's Harper Lecture. The Harper Lecture series began in 1979 with Hannah Holborn Gray speaking in San Francisco. As the need for critical thought remains apparent in all areas of life, we proudly continue this signature program to bring you stimulating conversations and fresh ideas. Our U Chicago community is a global one, and we are thrilled that technology can help us stay connected to one another. As you enjoy today's lecture, please note the following items. Your camera and video will be off. However, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask a question at any time during the talk. Closed captions are available by clicking the box at the bottom of your screen. Click Show Subtitles to enable this feature. If you're having trouble with audio or video, please try shutting down programs in the background, or you can dial in from your phone. Thank you once more for joining us. We couldn't do this without you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Harper Lecture, Recovering Black Love on Screen, Unearthing Lost Films and the Traces of Alternative Histories, with Professor Allison Nadia Field. I'm Andrea Hodgman, Senior Associate Director of Intellectual Engagement and Travel and the Program Manager for the Harper Lecture Series. I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's event. On behalf of everyone at the UChicago Alumni Office, thank you for joining us. Please allow me to introduce our moderator. Kenesha Passard is an Assistant Professor of English at the University of Chicago, where she is also a faculty affiliate of the Center for Race, Politics, and Culture, the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, the Center for Latin American Studies, and a member of the Committee in Southern Asian Studies. She writes about legacies of slavery and emancipation in the Caribbean and broader Americas, with a particular interest in how gender and sexuality structure race, labor, and capital. Professor Prasad is working on her first book project, An Illicit Wage. Her scholarship has been supported by the Mellon Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the American Council of Learned Societies and can be found in the journals American Quarterly, Small Acts, and the South Atlantic Quarterly. Professor Field and Prasad, thank you for joining us. Professor Prasad, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Allison Nadia Field, Associate Professor in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies here at the University of Chicago. Her scholarship contributes to evolving areas of study that investigate the functioning of race and representation in interdisciplinary contexts surrounding cinema. Her primary research interest is in African-American film, both silent era cinema and more contemporary filmmaking practices, and is unified by two broad theoretical inquiries, how film and visual media shape perceptions of race and ethnicity, and how these media have been and can be mobilized to perpetuate or challenge social inequities. Her work is grounded in sustained archival research, integrating that material with concerns of film form, media theory, and broader cultural questions of representation. Ali is the author of Uplift Cinema, The Emergence of African-American Film and the Possibility of Black Modernity, published in 2015. Co-editor along with Jacqueline Stewart and Jan Christopher Horak of LA Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema, published in 2015, and co-editor along with Marsha Gordon of Screening Race in American Non-Theatrical Film, published in 2019. On an ongoing basis, Ali is involved with archival projects such as a collaboration with the Chicago Film Archives on early Black filmmaking culture in Chicago. And in 2019, Ali was named an Academy Film Scholar, yes, by that Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for her in-progress book, Minstrelsy Vaudeville Cinema, American Popular Culture and Racialized Performance in Early Film. Unsurprisingly, here at the University of Chicago, Ali is indispensable to the humanities and to the study of African-American history, film, and media. She serves on the faculty advisory board of the Carla Shearer Center for the Study of American Culture, where she served as interim director in 2018-2019, the exec committee of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, the faculty advisory, Board of the New Undergraduate Major in Inquiry and Research in the Humanities, the Governing Board of the Frankie Institute for the Humanities, and the Faculty Board for the Master of Arts Program in the Humanities. Ali has also been a wonderful friend, interlocutor, and mentor since I arrived at the University of Chicago in 2018. 
The time we've spent together has ranged from deep study and workshopping in our Black archival theory group to picnics and cartwheels in Washington Park. So in addition to cheering me on in my scholarship, she's also helped me perfect the center of gravity in those cartwheels. Um, and I am <laughs> delighted to be in conversation with her tonight. Ali, the floor is yours. Kanisha, thank you so much. Andrea, thank you. And I'm just so happy to be here. Um, and to be in conversation with my good friend, Kanisha. Um, I am going to uh, share this right away. Of course, we are very familiar with, you know, the impediments to getting together and to travel that we've been living under now for nearly two years. Um, but I think one of the unexpected upsides of all of this has been the development of new ways of bridging distance and coming together as a community. Um, these webinars are one of them, and I'm really excited to share my work with alumni and friends, um, not just in Los Angeles, but everywhere. That said, Los Angeles was my home for many years. I was on the faculty of UCLA before coming to the University of Chicago in 2016. So my work has really been shaped in many ways by the city, its vibrant film community, and its really unparalleled archives. Now, the project that I'm going to share with you today has also been supported, as Kanisha really kindly said, by an Academy Film Scholars Grant given by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Um, we call it the Film Study Film Scholars Oscars, but it's really not, and it doesn't come with a statue, unfortunately. Um, but the Academy really has been at the forefront of bringing film history and film scholarship into more popular currency, uh, not least with the hiring of my friend, collaborator, and colleague, Jacqueline Stewart, as the artistic director of the Academy Museum. And I share with her a commitment to scholarship and public engagement that raises questions about how we grapple with a history of cinema that's marked by legacies of exclusion and systemic racism, both in the industry and in the broader culture. This is especially important, I think, given our own fraught moment of rising hate movements and emboldened resistance to principles of equity and inclusion. Now, the project that I'm going to share with you here is precisely about this issue. And the films that I'm going to talk about involve minstrelsy and racist tropes and terms from the 19th century, things that, while antiquated, still have charge today. This is difficult material. But it's also important. Part of the imperative, I believe, in doing this work is to sharply interrogate the past, but also to mine the archive for moments of resistance and evidence of practices that counter dominant racist discourse. It's also about finding moments of joy, laughter, and humor in the face of wider oppression. Themes that I think are especially fitting in Black History Month and on the heels of Valentine's Day. Now, this story starts back in January 2017, when I received an email from Dino Everett, the film archivist at USC and punk rock aficionado, with an image from an unidentified 50-foot nitrate print from around 1900, part of a box of films that he had acquired from a collector in New Orleans. Now, Dino was struck by what appeared to be, in his words, an early positive depiction of well-dressed Black people from the silent era. In his email, he asked a simple question. Does this seem important? The answer, pretty clearly to me, was yes. <laughs> what struck me as so extraordinary was not just their dress but the fact that the man and woman embrace repeatedly and in a strikingly non-caricatured way. They laugh and smile in a really seemingly uninhibited manner. I was taken by the apparent naturalism of their performance that seemed to go against the grain of racialized comedy of the era. Unlike the ubiquitous portrayal of black subjects in demeaning racist caricatures, these performers are not the butt of any joke nor is their kiss a punchline. Their performance is naturalistic and they express joy and intimacy in a presentation of seemingly genuine affection. Now, I couldn't think of anything like it in silent cinema and certainly not in the medium's earliest years. But what was it? <laughs> it was an archival mystery. 
This was a question of identification. What, when, who is this? But also a question of significance. How to make sense of this media artifact, its apparent uniqueness, and its possible meanings for both early cinema and also for film historiography. Now here, I'm gonna sketch how we did the detective work uh, to identify the film, and then talk a little bit about what it means, basically what a historian does to make sense of the past, and also how it resonates in our own moment, the moment it resurfaced after nearly 120 years of dormancy. Now to start with the most immediate question, that of identification, what were we looking at? Well, at its most basic level, this appeared to be a version of the famous John C. Rice May Irwin kiss that was filmed at Thomas Edison studio in 1896 and depicting their famous kiss from the stage production of the play, The Widow Jones. Known as the May Irwin kiss or just the kiss, it became the most popular film shown on Edison's Vitascope during 1896. And as with many popular films in early cinema, there were subsequent iterations of the Kiss film, including one shot also by Edison in 1900, but with different performers, known as the Kiss or the New Kiss. So what we seem to have found was a version of the Kiss film, but with black performers. So we turned to early film producers catalogs to search for possible titles. Um, though films were typically sold by subject, not by title per se. Now, some of these catalogs have been digitized and are added to databases and can be searched. Um, some are on microfilm and some are only available in archives. But what we found were six distinct titles of African-American kiss films with varying degrees of racist caricature in the titles and descriptions sold by American producers, though none thought to be extant or surviving. However, note of caution, this doesn't mean that there were six different films given rampant pirating of the era or that they were accurately dated since prints were sold for several years. But from descriptions and other factors, I believe that three of these titles refer to the same film and that the other three are distinct films or at least two different films. Now from the catalog evidence that we collected, we return then to the print material itself. The nitrate print was, and you see a scan of it here, was in really great shape for its age. Um, and remarkably, it's a first generation negative to positive print. And it contained clearly visible clues in the edge of the frame. What you see here circled are perforation print throughs, which show an odd shape for an American manufacturer, but were recognizable as the round perf holes made by the French Lumière Cinématographe which was a combination camera projector. So Lumiere prints are characterized by these single pair of perforation hole circles on each frame. But the, in our catalog research, there were no Lumiere films on the subject, but the Lumiere style perfs do represent an important clue, one that points back to the United States and to Chicago. Now, filmmaker William Selig came from the vaudeville circuit and had returned to his native Chicago in late 1895, early 1896. And he set out to develop a motion picture camera and projector to rival that of Thomas Edison. To get around the patent, Selig found a collaborator who had gotten his hands on an early Lumiere cinematograph and copied it. So what came to be known as the Selig polyscope was in effect a knockoff of the Lumiere cinematograph. What this means is that early Selig films have the same perforation marks as those made by Lumiere. And in many film archives, there are reels of unidentified Lumiere films that are probably actually Selig polyscope films. So it seemed quite likely that this film could be Selig's Something Good Negro Kiss, marketed to exhibitors as a burlesque or a parody of the popular May Irwin Kiss. Now, while the Selig catalog starts listing the film under the title Something Good Negro Kiss in 1903, this date was suspect. Just as films were frequently pirated by rival manufacturers, they were also reused and in circulation for years. So even though the Selig catalogs list the title starting in 1903, 
we were pretty sure that it was older than that. Now, thankfully, two other sources helped refine that dating. Now, thanks to litigation, at the time everybody was suing everybody for patent infringement, there was an inventory of Selig Polyscope Company property that was compiled in December 1900. And this inventory lists a film under the title, Something Good Negro Kiss. So the film must have been produced in or before 1900. Now dating gets even more refined when we follow other leads. It turns out that Chicago-based Selig sold his films through the Chicago-based Sears Roebuck catalog starting in spring 1898. And indeed in that catalog, there's a kissing scene that matches the description that we're looking for which we know is the right film because it shows up in a Sears specialty catalog for motion picture equipment and prints with a hand-drawn sketch from a keyframe image from that film. So by looking at a range of sources, we determined that this film artifact was Something Good Negro Kiss, filmed by William Selig in Chicago in 1898. And then this identification and dating let us go farther especially in figuring out the identity of the performers. Now, as a Selig film of this period, Something Good Negro Kiss would have been shot in Chicago at his studio at Pet Court, where um, Columbia College is today. So the performers were likely Chicago-based or passing through the city at the time. And Selig's background is really important here, given that he was a manager of minstrel shows before becoming a film producer. Selig was even credited as launching the careers of Burt Williams and George Walker, who were the most famous black performers of their time. So Selig really would have known Chicago's minstrel and vaudeville performers. And because of his stature and his success as a manager of minstrel companies, local performers would have likely been eager to oblige a request for a performance in front of the polyscope. But figuring out who these performers were was like finding a needle in a haystack. Now, luckily, <laughs> really luckily for us, curators at the Museum of Modern Art had recently had some success in, the identify in identifying the actors in the Burt Williams Line Kiln Club Field Day project, which was rediscovered rushes in the MoMA vaults of a never released film from 1913. They were using analog facial recognition and they created a database of possible performers. So presenting them with the stills from the USC print led to two fascinating discoveries. First, it turned out that MoMA was already working with a similar African-American kiss film held by the Library of Congress and cataloged as Sambo and Jemima comedians based on a title sketched into the emulsion. This nitrate print was a shorter fragment in less good shape, but clearly recognizable in it was the same actor as in the USC print, albeit with a different partner. Now, I believe that this film is Lubin's New Colored Kiss number two from 1900. But who was this performer kissing two different women in two similar yet distinct films? The second discovery gave us an answer. He matched an 1898 photograph of four minstrel performers copyrighted by a Chicago-based popular music publisher. The photograph captions the performers as Maud Brewer, J.W. Brewer, Gertie Brown, and Saint Subtle, the last being recognizable as the man in both film prints. Now looking further, we found that the September 1899 National Police Gazette, which was like a tabloid men's lifestyle magazine, featured another photo of these performers, two of the group known as the Ragtime Four, in which it becomes clear that the woman in the USC print is Gertie Brown. So in this one, her head is sort of at an angle and we weren't entirely confident that we could identify her based on this picture, but here it's completely clear. So based on material evidence and catalog sources, we knew that the two films were made by different producers a few years apart. So St. Subtle appears in two different Kiss films with two different partners. One is Gertie Brown, the other as of yet unknown, produced by two different film companies within a few years of each other. So more mysteries, <laughs> but focusing on something good Negro Kiss. Subtle and Brown were fairly well-known 
um, performers in Chicago, um, working at the time with Maud and John W. Brewer as the Ragtime Four. These were vaudeville performers who were celebrated for their cakewalk interpretation in particular. Now, looking into genealogical research, we found that Gertie Brown uh, was born in 1878. Um, and there you can see it's listed her profession as actress. Um, so making her 20 years old when she was performing with St. Subtle. And in 1915, she married Tim Moore. And together they were a successful vaudeville act known as Tim and Gertie until her death in 1934. Now, Tim Moore would go on to achieve fame on the Amos and Andy show on television quite a bit later. Now, for his part, St. Subtle was a working performer who was also a composer of ragtime songs. Now, he worked in the popular genre that were called coon songs. But interestingly, he refuted many of the stereotypes that were prevalent in the genre. His songs reflected his dandy persona, the swell that he portrays in Something Good Negro Kiss. Now, Subtle seems to have worked consistently into the teens and less so in the 20s. And then he dies in 1932. Um, this is his Cook County death certificate. And part of this work, as I see it, is restoring the humanity to people who've been mistreated by the historical record. And here you can see there's very little effort that's put into filling out the information about Subtle or his family. So I want to approach these figures with a degree of care um, and understanding about them um, as people. So that explains the film's identification, its dating, and the discovery of the performer's identity, and a little bit about their professional life. But what are they doing in Something Good Negro Kiss? How do we make sense of this film? So to get at this question, I think first we need to watch it. So what you're seeing here is a digital copy of the restored nitrate print that Dino did at USC. And I think seeing the figures move really shows the kind of casual familiarity that Subtle and Brown had with each other and the enjoyment that they were taking, um, the fun that they were having uh, with this, the scene that they're performing. Brown even at times kind of coyly demurs before laughingly embracing Subtle. And I think watching the film puts into stark relief the incongruity between what appears in the frame and the presumption of racialized comedy based on the descriptions of the film as a burlesque, a burlesque on the Rice Irwin kiss. And also between how the figures appear and the arguments that film historians have made about African-Americans in the early cinema. Short as it is, Something Good, Negro Kiss prompts a quite radical rethinking of racialized representation and performance in early cinema. And this is not just because it adds to our knowledge of the period, though given that over 90% of films from the early period of American filmmaking are considered lost, newly discovered materials, not trivial. But it's also a rare positive and naturalistic representation of Black humanity at a time of deeply antipathetic racist representations. Yet what makes this film so important is the way I think it quickly leads into deeper waters, making me question what I understood to be the foundations of American cinema. And I'll give you one example. Now, as I noted, before, Something Good Negro Kiss was sold to exhibitors as a burlesque or a parody of Thomas Edison's famous John C. Rice May Irwin Kiss from 1896. Now this was a selling point, but what did that illusion mean? What was the reference here? What would it have meant to exhibitors, but also spectators? Now we know um, that Edison's film recreated the kiss scene from the stage play, The Widow Jones from the previous year. But there's so much more going on here than just that. Although her career uh, is now largely forgotten, May Irwin was in fact a famous minstrel performer at the time, known for popularizing what were known as coon songs in ragtime um, in a genre <laughs> sung by white women called coon shouting, in which she, May Irwin, fascinatingly adopted the persona of a threatening black man. And yet 
it hasn't been part of historians' discussion of the May Irwin kiss that the play the film was based on, in fact, feature a, a number of Irwin's minstrel songs. So even though she didn't perform in blackface makeup, she was a minstrel performer who traded on egregious racist representations of black people. This was part of her performance persona. This was what she was famous for. So when we confront this aspect of the May Irwin kiss, I think it can tell us a lot about what St. Subtle and Gertie Brown are doing. Seen in relation to May Irwin's racial masquerade, something good Negro kiss can be understood as making visible what was only implicit in Edison's film, restoring racialized performativity to the screen, and importantly, refuting the racist caricature that May Irwin's presence carried. So what does it mean, we might ask, to do a racial burlesque of a film that was already racialized? Well, I think it adds a layer of humor or more accurately places the humor not on the bodies of the African-American performers whose work was presumed to be that of comedy, but redirects it in a gesture of irony back to May Irwin herself. Something good Negro kiss makes overt the implicit joke of the Rice Irwin kiss. But it does something more and it goes beyond the structure of a burlesque. With its less stylized, more naturalistic performances and the ease and affection conveyed by Subtle and Brown, it presents a powerful image of African-American intimacy that escapes the frames of meaning imposed by catalog descriptions, the illusions associated with minstrelsy, and the broader context of racialized representation in early cinema. It's at once a performance and not, a burlesque on the Rice Irwin kiss and its rebuttal. It's a Negro kiss and something good. Now this context that I only briefly gloss here, I think teaches us an important lesson. Film history has tended to posit sophisticated debates about race and performance as concerns of the late 20th and 21st century. But here we see just how prevalent and complex these imbrications were for early cinema as well. In rethinking the emergence of American filmmaking in the late 19th century, I hope to restore legibility to these films by reassessing the interrelations of forms of minstrelsy, vaudeville, and cinema at a period of really complexly functioning racial tropes and significations. So what do we know about who saw the film and how audiences received it? This was a question posed by somebody in the pre-registration form. And alas, the answer is that we know very little. Um, I've yet to find any direct accounts of spectators' reactions, any mention in the mainstream African American press, mainstream or African American press, for example. And the Sears corporate archives are closed to researchers, so we don't know who ordered it from the Sears catalog, for example, though presumably exhibitors did. However, we do have some indication of where the film was exhibited. And this presents us with some exciting possibilities for more speculative approaches to thinking about how audiences might have received it. Now, like many early cinema attractions, African-American kiss films were shown in a variety of contexts from upscale opera houses to fairgrounds. We know it was shown at Atlantic City, for example, state fairs to smaller theaters and Nickelodeons and even non-theatrical spaces like churches, including here in Hyde Park and department stores. Um, as you see here in this Christmas treat Vitascope ex exhibition at a department store in Wichita, Kansas. Now being so short, these films were shown on a program of mixed subjects. We know that the film was shown alongside actualities of the Spanish American War, comedies like Edison's Seminary Girls Pillow Fight, um, trick films, fight films, like boxing films, and a range of other early cinema attractions. What's fascinating to me to think about is what kind of representational work Something Good Negro Kiss does when considered in adjacency to other films and how its meaning might shift across various exhibition contexts. Now the film, as we saw, 
was marketed in racist terms, to be sure. But it's my contention that the performance of Subtle and Brown refutes the racist framing of distributors and exhibitors. Further, next to other films, how would something good Negro Kiss inflect the reception of other early films involving Black people or presuming comedy predicated on racialized representation? Imagined alongside Blackface farce, for example, what kinds of assertion of naturalism and humanity might it convey? What arguments for the illegitimacy of racist caricature might it inherently make? Might it have functioned as a surreptitious demonstration of Black humanity in the context of rampant misrepresentations across visual culture? Now, in an opposite vein, we know that a KISS film with Black performers was part of an exhibit of films that was shown in Charlotte, North Carolina at Grace Church, which is an African-American congregation in December 1900 as part of a fundraiser for the building of a new church completed in 1901, which you see here. Now, we can't know which exact film it was. But the valences such a film would have had in the context of a Black church are certainly different than in a segregated theatrical context. And we can well imagine that audiences in an intra-racial setting might respond very differently to a film than they would have in an integrated theater, for example. So would these Black parishioners have been dismayed by the degree of affection shown by Sadler Brown? something that potentially goes against the image of respectability that was promoted by the church? Or would the non-caricatured performance have been welcome? These are the kinds of uncertainties that I think make this film especially rich for revisiting questions of early film spectatorship. Now, as, early, as important as this film is to historians, others have seized on this rediscovery. For me, the broader public reception of the film's rediscovery is just as important as the historical work that I've been laying out. And once we were confident in the identification of the film and its dating and all of that, we nominated to the National Film Registry, um, which is a list of historically, culturally, and artistically significant films named by the Library of Congress each year. And in December 2018, it was added, um, where it's listed, as you can see here, along with the May Irwin Kiss, um, which is listed under the title The Kiss. The naming to the National Registry catapulted the film to national and international attention. Um, I was told that the initial University of Chicago news story, which you see here on the bottom right, written by Jack Wang, was the most shared news story out of the university in 2018. And this attention has resulted in really fortuitous uh, additional rediscoveries, including a cakewalk film made around the same time as Something Good Negro Kiss with the same performers, and an alternative version of the film discovered more recently in Norway. And this is a longer version that shows their kiss in the context of a dance or a sketch, and you really see them as performers. And I think this is important because it helps underscore that they really were professionals. The film may have the sort of impromptu element, but these are seasoned pros. Um, they're acting for the camera and it's charming, but that shouldn't take away or detract from their labor as performers. So much of the work that I think will come from this will involve understanding these new discoveries. Um, we'll be able to access a fuller history of the stage and screen careers of St. Subtle and Gertie Brown and other performers of the time and even speculate, as I suggested, on the possible implications of the screening of this passionate embrace of African-Americans between, for a range of audiences across the country and in different exhibition contexts. But beyond exciting archival rediscoveries, Something Good Negro Kiss clearly has resonance for the contemporary moment as an interest in the film has reached beyond the community of scholars and archivists already committed to the study of early cinema. After the film was named to the National Registry, Twitter personality Kyle Alex Brett set the film to the score of Barry Jenkins' If Beale Street Could Talk on the day of that film's premiere. And the Oprah Winfrey Network series Black Love Doc posted it to Instagram with sobbing emojis, we're not crying, you are. The resulting exposure from these initial posts created 
a tremendous response to social media with shares and comments from significant Hollywood figures like Jenkins, Violet Davis, Tracy Ellis Roth, Lena Waithe, Jada Pickett Smith, and Janelle Monet. Poet and president of the Mellon Foundation, Elizabeth Alexander shared it. The creator of hashtag Oscars So White, April Rain, retweeted it. And the Blacklist founder, Franklin Leonard, commented, quote, absolutely broke me. Now, while surprising, especially for those of us working in the relative bubble of archives and academia, these responses also make sense. The film resonates today with contemporary representation of Black love on screen in films such as Barry Jenkins' Moonlight and If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a connection made all the more apparent by Kyle Alex Brett's initial tweet. Social media comments have accordingly focused on the performer's unreserved and untempered expression of joy. But social media comments have also reflected a bittersweet response. There's something so sweet yet so sad about this footage, one viewer wrote, while Kyle himself said, I've been crying watching that on loop, and I think it's because they seem so happy, and I feel so angry wondering what 1900 did with that happiness. Alongside moving uh, stories of parents and grandparents falling in love, there were a number of comments that pointed to the historical erasure and misrepresentation of African-American love and affection in American cinema. Such as, imagine if our grandparents and parents were able to see this in their prime. And that celebrated the power that cinema has to imagine a powerful image against the syst systematic refutation of black humanity. Someone said, this is like opening a time capsule and seeing love in its purest form. It's beautiful to see, but hard to know the hateful times that we're living in. As Tracy Ellis Ross notes, seeing images of black love and black joy is special. We don't get enough of this. And this is from 1898. At a time of virulent systemic and representational racism, which is a statement true for 1898 as it is now, representation matters. As Goddess of Gumbo told her Twitter followers, artists were fighting the battle of representation. No blackface, just hashtag black love. That these responses and these questions still persist is a major impetus for me in pursuing this work. And it's a reminder of the imperative that film scholarship can have to witness the incredible resilience of African-American performers fighting for self-representation and for a screen image rooted not in caricature, but in humanity. And the viral circulation also meant that the film got seen by contemporary artists who were also inspired by it. And these include very well-known filmmakers like Khalil Pedisai and Kevin Drome Everson, who made a short film, Glenville, as both homage and recreation and reimagining of something good Negro kiss in the contemporary moment. And poet Gabriel Daniels published a poem inspired by it. And these are just two examples of contemporary artists who have been inspired by this archival rediscovery. So I think the takeaway is that it's very true that early cinema was a largely hostile terrain for the representation of African-Americans. I mean, there May Irwin is a canonical figure of American film history. And somehow we've alighted the fact that she was a minstrel performer who traded on racist masquerade. So my goal here has been to correct that and restore some of the historical legibility to her figure and to how we understand the May Irwin kiss. But also, Something Good Negro Kiss indicates the possibility for African-American performance that employed the garb of minstrelsy to resist the racialized caricatures pervasive on turn of the century stages and screens. And we can see it as a gesture of resistance conveyed through a display of affection, an assertion of humanity in a medium that was largely hostile to black figures. And I think that's what's so powerful about the film then as well as now. I'm really excited to talk with you and with Kanisha about this. So I'm gonna stop talking and stop sharing. Thank you so much, Allie. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A. 
Um, I will start with a comment from CK Meng, who says, um, I just want to say that the level of research is astounding. The film is so amazing and I didn't know about the Norway film. When I was researching the Burt Williams film, I was astounded to find so many pictures of black vaudeville performers, which really helped me out. Well, who really helped me out was CK, who, came, who was the one who basically created that database um, at MoMA um, when they were in, inter, interning at MoMA um, or working at MoMA on that project and, uh, and was doing the, the really the work of doing the analog facial recognition and figuring out who all these amazing performers were that had been lost to history because there weren't records kept of them. So um, huge shout out to you, CK. Great. Well, there are two questions that I think we can combine. So the first is from Ulrika Brand, um, who says, could you please speak more about the context of film viewing in the period? Um, who went to see films? Where? And were all the film shorts? And then the other related question is from William Brigham, who says, I think the question of who might have seen the film is an interesting and important one. What would have been the motivation of white audiences to watch this, unless, of course, they expected typical racist representations? Right. Um, great questions. So um, in brief, you know, films of this period, this is really at the dawn of this technology as a form of public entertainment. And so these films were short. They're 50 feet. They're long as I, I showed, um, you know, about 20 seconds, sometimes a little longer, sometimes shorter. They're short subjects. And um, what my colleague Tom Gunning calls attractions. And they were kind of based on this idea of appealing to an audience, direct address. They're showing something kind of need and entertaining and grabbing um, this, the audience's uh, attention, kind of in the manner that you would see from stage performers or like carnival barkers, that kind of thing. And so it's modeled on that. And so what you see in early film exhibitions is kind of a combination, a stringing together of short subjects that could be, could be thematically linked or could be totally random. Um, which I think is interesting, as I tried to allude to that what happens when you put a film like this up against something that is like a watermelon eating contest, you know, what kind of power does it have to refute the kind of racist caricature that's held by those other kinds of representations. Um, there were also shown um, in combination with live performance. So you would have live actors there plus films. And I think that's interesting if we think about what kind of what was popular culture at this time, it was really pervaded by minstrelsy and by blackface performance. So if you have a bunch of performers either on film or on stage who are white actors in blackface, and then you show this, it's doing amazing, powerful work, I think, in, in um, rejecting that as, you know, as masquerade. Um, and there's a lot we could say about that. Who would see these films? Well, everybody went to the movies. <laughs> like This was the, the moment when, um, you know, this was, mass culture, right? And so uh, this led to a lot of debates in, um, in our society about, uh, you know, who should be watching movies, um, children, women, you know, the impressionable immigrants. And so uh, the kind of status of moving pictures at this time was very much in flux and, and was coming under debate. Um, so let's just say everyone. And in the different contexts that we find that this film pops up, that we found at least, um, because again, we have, it's not like films were advertised by title, sometimes subjects would be listed and that's what we found. And so they're very different. So whether it's in a black church with an entirely black congregation or whether it's in an interracial church in Hyde Park with, with mixed, uh, mixed race parishioners watching this entertainment, it's a very different thing than if it's in a loop theater um, downtown being shown in a lunchtime you know, show um, alongside with a lot of other things. But in any case, I think there's something, and this is part, I think, of one of the questions about um, you know, how they were framed. I mean, they were framed to be, and it was presumed that there was inherent comedy there because they were black performers. What I think is so interesting is the way the film just resists that. And even if the descriptions, and even if someone, the, the barker in the theater was saying all this racist stuff, there's something about their performance that is just pushes that aside. Um, and I think that must have been incredibly powerful at the time. Absolutely. And in addition to the, the kind of category of resistance, I think about 
uh, refusal in the work of Tina Camp and the Practicing Refusal Collective as another kind of force that might animate this short. Uh, we have a few questions about um, Selig. Um, so from David Cruz Uribe, um, what in your view was he trying to accomplish by making this film in this form? And then uh, a related question from Edgar um, Pierluci, um, who says, what was in it for Selig to shoot this film? I imagine with this new technology, it was expensive. Yeah. Um, so, Selig, what, you know, what was the motivation? Um, I think that there, I think, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is my hunch uh, is that he, th that Subtle and Brown were at the studio filming the cakewalk film. I think he wanted to make a cakewalk film. It was a popular genre at the time. It was a huge international fad and he was near all these performers um, who were well known for their cakewalking. And so I think he invited the, the Ragtime Four to his studio to do the cakewalk film. And then I, I think given the kind of way that something Good Negro Kiss feels a little improvised, my hunch is that that was sort of secondary to the main business of the day, which was the cakewalk, and that they were there doing, um, and they did it as, as, and he did, he did it as a spoof on the May Irwin Kiss. So I think his intentions were like, this is a funny version of the May Irwin kiss as there were so many and that will sell. Um, you know, I think that what's interesting at this moment is that the director doesn't have the same kind of authorial control that he directors come to have as the industry becomes um, more codified and consolidated in the classical period. So in this moment, you see like the camera is set up they do their thing and the camera turns off. <laughs> like there's no camera movement, there's no editing. And so I think that gives the performers a degree of kind of space to really express their performativity. And so that's why I you know, ascribe them a kind of form of agency here because it's their performance, it's their kind of candor that we see. Um, even if the conditions were set up in order to kind of capitalize on this kind of racist masquerade. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it reminds me of conversations we've had before about um, moments in which performers uh, kind of suspend their performance, mm -hmm. perhaps off stage, but not off camera, and what it means for them to employ their agency in these selective ways. Yeah, um, and I think we see that, I mean, in the cakewalk film, when they're in the background, they're kind of off stage, <laughs> though they're still being captured by the camera. And then they come, they do their dancing. And then, I mean, it's very brief and I didn't show it to you, but there is this kind of switch on, switch off. Yeah. Absolutely. So there are a few questions about May Irwin, um, one from Agnes Lugo, Hi, Ortiz, Agnes. Um, who says, uh, this is wonderful, indeed a true archival feat. Um, one question about May Irwin and your reading um, of Negro Kiss as a refusal of her racist minstrelsy. Um, if I did not uh, misunderstand you, you also said that her performance was cross-dressed. If this is correct, then Negro Kiss is also a refusal um, of involving gender crossing or impersonation, a double refusal. How does this complicate your interpretation? And then there's um, another um, question about May Irwin that just asks for a bit more context about the tone of her work. Mm. Um, so Agnes is our colleague in Romance Languages and Literatures um, and um, my comrade in the Slavery and Visual Culture uh, Working Group. So welcome, Agnes. Um, yes, so I think that there is a gender point here too, which is why in the larger project, I actually see St. Subtle as the corollary to May Irwin, that he's actually responding to her. Um, there's all sorts of, I mean, I could talk about May Irwin all night, but I'll give you a little, a little bit of the sense of just how deep this runs, um, that it wasn't just that she was doing these performances um, and sort of singing in this dialect um, of, of Black men and kind of embodying that. She would be on the stage sometimes in these performances and they would, in the mise-en-scene, they would have an actual Black performer come up behind her with like a razor blade and the audience would gasp. And then she would keep singing and they'd realize, oh, it was part of the, the comedy and the act and it would diffuse that kind of tension. And so there's a lot of performing of neutralizing of threat of Black masculinity going on 
through this white woman's body. And so I think that there's a lot happening here of like dealing with modernity, dealing with um, urban culture, dealing with the increasing rise of African-American male presence in the public sphere, a lot of fear around that. Um, that is all being worked out through May Irwin and her presence and her performativity. Um, Saint Subtle, I think, is very is responding to this. When we look at his sheet music, as I showed you some examples, his songs basically <laughs> he takes tropes that she sings about and basically like you know undoes them. And I think that's a very deliberate gesture um, against her and the kind of type of music that she represented. Mm -hmm. We have a number of exciting questions left and I do want to get to them. So um, from Reginald Jackson, who says, thank you for the exciting presentation. With Horton Spiller's notion of pornotroping in mind, I was struck by your description of the actors as seasoned pros. Could you say more about how their skill as paid performers might work against both 19th century and contemporary desires or needs to see their kiss as authentic or candid? Yes, um, thank you for that. I mean, one of the things that, um, so uh, there are several things I wanna say about this. One is that um, there, as you saw from all the social media response, there was um, this kind of sense that we were looking into a window of this like unvarnished glimpse of love and that th these were clearly lovers and that it was as if the camera wasn't there. And we know that that's not true because we know how performance worked, we know how cinema worked, and they were very much aware of the camera and they were performing for it. That doesn't mean that there wasn't something candid about it. But I think by emphasizing the kind of love aspect, we risk taking away from their professionalism and the fact that these were, and their labor as performers. And that's something that I, I struggle with um, when I talk about this work, because I don't want to correct the af affect and the effective response people have to this film then or now. Um, but I think it's important to be to honor the the work that they did and recognize them as performers. And I think this is especially important um, in African American performance, where for so much of the history of American cinema and entertainment. African Americans have been seen as natural entertainers or that there's this sense of like the Nicholas brothers go on stage and unrehearsed they do it in one take and it's just like innate skill. Um, and I think by just talking about them without underscoring them as performers and professionals, it kind of can contribute risk contributing to that, um, that tendency that I really wanna push back on. Um, I don't know, Kanisha, do you have thoughts on, on pornotroping in particular here? Um, so what I would say is that I, I have been thinking more generally about the attachments that we bring to um, objects that have sensitive histories and that have um, uh, violent histories and so, um, whether those attachments, you know, might risk perpetuating, as you say, um, a, a kind of limiting uh, image or controlling image of um, Black subjects is, is always, I think, a question that critics and viewers, especially those critics and view viewers who are kind of implicated in the, um, the content or the history of the object have to confront. So that's what I would say. Um, so I would love to talk to Reginald more about that, but yeah, <laughs> we um, have a great technological question as well from Jamie and Carla Hine. Um, so you mentioned the MoMA database to help identify actors in films. Research tells us that there's great inequality in face recognition algorithms used to identify Black subjects particularly female, black and 18 to 30 year olds. Has this been an issue in research and what efforts are being made to address such bias? Um, CK, if you're there, can you type in your response to that? Um, CK is an archivist at the Smithsonian um, that Museum of, Nat of African American History and Culture. But um, I did say analog facial recognition, <laughs> which, which sounds fancy, but it's like photo, photo, look, look. So it's, this is the low tech um, way of recognizing performers, which is, but you're in, totally right that the technology has a problem here. Um, I think the part of the problem 
is that we don't actually have um, such a database, like a, I mean, such a, a database that's searchable. Um, so this, and we don't have a lot of material that survives from this period. We have the very famous performers, which I think helped MoMA out because they were dealing with Burt Williams and, and Odessa Warren Gray and, and figures who had a photographic record. But St. Subtle and Gritty Brown are kind of like a tier below, right? Several tiers below. So they're just working performers and there isn't that kind of broad base of photographic records um, for performers like that. There's a lot of, you know, various libraries have unidentified photos, but that requires a tremendous amount of work to, to sift through. Um, I hope someday that what we can do is create precisely this kind of database and work with computer scientists um, and AI experts on precisely refining these algorithmic tools that are so based on so much bias as we know. Mm -hmm. I think we probably have time for one more question um, from Melissa Adams Campbell, who asks, I wonder if you could talk about the history of Black cinemas in Chicago. Was there a space for Black Chicago audiences to view these films in non-segregated spaces? Yes, thank you, Professor Adams Campbell, another friend. Um, oh, I hate when the questions disappear. <laughs> so um, yes, so Chicago, if we, Fast forward about 10 years from the period I'm talking about, Chicago is really the, the center of um, black movie making. Um, and another figure that I work on is William Foster, who's considered the first black filmmaker. He starts making films in, uh, for commercial audiences in Chicago in 1913. But, you know, turn of the century, 1903, I think, is when the Pekin Theater opens, 1902. And this is a theater based on the south side of Chicago, um, with its own stock company of African-American performers for Black audiences. And so there is a thriving theater scene um, here. So what's interesting to me about the films that are made by Black filmmakers in the teens uh, is that they're made both for Black audiences, so they're considered race films, um, films with predominantly Black cast made for Black audiences. And then they're also showing these films in the loop and at, at predominantly white theaters. And so there's this idea of like these different audiences and multiple voices going on in, in the address of these films that I think is really fascinating. Um, that's a whole other topic. Um, CK did answer the question. Kanisha, do you wanna read? Yes, absolutely. So CK says, yes, I was comparing photos on my computer monitor. AI facial recognition does not have widespread use in the archive right now. And those are definitely concerns. All of my work has to do with African-American cinema and AI has built in bias that makes its use suspect right now. Yeah, so we should write a NEH grant or something to, to solve this problem. I think that would be great. I wanted to point that in the in the chat, hopefully everybody can see it, um, that uh, uh, M. Mole said that the, the film that I mentioned, Glenville, is actually streaming right now on the Criterion channel. And I also put up there a link to a short piece that I wrote about Glenville um, and talking to the filmmakers about what they were doing and, and kind of how it was working with the kind of politics of place. Um, so if you're interested in, in the contemporary responses, um, I encourage you to look at that. Well, as our time together is running low, I'd love to invite Andrea back to bring a close to tonight's wonderful event. Thank you, Professor Field, for sharing your work with us. It's so important. Um, and thank you, Professor Passard, for being here to extend the conversation so thoughtfully. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon.